Hello, everybody. Now, so once again, I'm back here with a, a sort of combo uh, Ed puzzle. I thought instead of trying to make three separate ones, it would be easier for all of us just to sort of combine them all. And uh, once again, I have to compliment everyone and really extend my appreciation for the uh, amazing work, really, on the discussion board, uh, the nuggets, the uh, the video responses, the audio responses. It's just been really uh, enlightening for me. I hope it is uh, has been for you as well. But I really, I, you know, I'd go so far actually to, as to say that I think the discussion that we're seeing in this class, even though this is a, uh, you know, an online class, I think the level of discussion has been uh, equal to, if not superior, actually, to many of the discussions I've had in a face-to-face -face, uh, graduate level courses. So I think you should be really, really proud, I, I think, of that. Uh, but let's, uh, I wanted to give you some of my thoughts on this. I don't know if I can compete with you all, but... Uh, maybe you'll appreciate some of my insights. I want to hear from you about a, a few points. I got three questions embedded in here that I, I would like you to uh, to uh, think about. All right. So first off, this uh, Romberger piece. Uh, the main ideas of this one, I thought, uh, was about this uh, rhetorical canon of memory and how we might uh, resurrect that canon to talk about how we could use it to evaluate forms of evidence as uh, well as to make uh, multimodal arguments more cohesive. And I thought this was a pretty interesting premise. Uh, you, I'm sure you're aware of the uh, classical rhetorical canon of memory. Uh, you know, there's, there's five canon. Uh, what is it? Invention, arrangement, uh, style, delivery, and memory. And usually, uh, well, I would say delivery too, but we, we tend to not really spend that much time on the memory canon anymore uh, because we just assume it's not, you know, our students don't really have the need to memorize all that much stuff anymore. Even our professional uh, orators these days have teleprompters or they're reading from notes and, and whatnot. So there's just not a lot of demand for this anymore, you know, outside of, I, I guess, the speech department. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, Romberger here wants to rethink the, rethink the canon. And usually, I've seen this done before, but it's usually the idea is that instead of talking about memorization, we talk about memorability. And I think about ways to make an essay stick around, stick in your mind longer after you've read it. But uh, this author, I think, pulls an interesting maneuver uh, by rethinking, uh, sort of redefining memory as social memory or even a computer memory. And then also extending this, the mnemonic of the house or the uh, memory palace. Uh, as a theater uh, metaphor instead. So two very interesting moves. I really like what she's doing here with this uh, rhetorical canon of memory. Uh, she starts uh, talking about, and I think this is a really valuable part of the article, uh, talking about how do we evaluate new forms of evidence. And I noticed several of your nuggets talked about this. You know, what do you do when you have the student that's citing uh, Wikipedia? Uh, I see that more often, frankly, than Slashdot or Dig or YouTube or whatever it may be. Uh, a lot of us might respond simply by saying that's unacceptable because of these reasons, right? It's not a Wikipedia is not affiliated with the institution of higher learning or, or scholarship, right? The, we don't know anything about the credentials of these authors. Uh, maybe the uh, actually Wikipedia is pretty good about citing uh, bibliographic sources, but I don't, I don't think Digger Slash dot are. But nevertheless, outside of uh, Academe, uh, these are especially slash dot and dig, or slash dot in particular, have a lot of respect uh, among the among expert users, right? Uh, it's not like these sites are are uh, you know highly uh, prone to error or things. They have all these built-in mechanisms: uh, voting, polls, commenting, uh, feedback. Uh, there's various mechanisms to make sure that uh, crappy stuff doesn't get left up there for long. And Wikipedia too, you've seen that already, how there's so much, there's a lot of built-in error correction and vetting. Actually, a lot of uh, people think Wikipedia is just free for all, but you know, we, we know at this point, it's actually pretty well vetted. As, but, uh, you know, how do you go about this? We don't want to just, uh, you, you know, we want to have an intelligent rubric uh, in place so that we don't just have to tell students yay or nay, but give them some tools for assessing uh, these this new sort of evidence, right? And uh, her mechanism for this is to, again, to uh, redefine what we mean by memory. Uh, think about memory as more of, I guess, what you'd call a collective memory or a social memory, community, communal memory. Uh, and 
the tactic there is to think about who has the, the most access to this memory, I suppose, or the, who's, who's the arbiters, you know, who's, who's, who gets to decide uh, what stays in the memory uh, or what just comes and goes. Or if thinking about something like Dig, for example, uh, if you're familiar with that site or Reddit, I think it's another similar sort of uh, site. Uh, so some of that stuff gets posted at the top, stays there for a long time, basically on the charts, if you will, uh, whereas uh, other stuff never rises above and is, is quickly forgotten. Uh, so that's kind of the way I'm thinking. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's, the, I think that's the page uh, that Romberger and I are on with this. Uh, but the argument uh, she makes is it's usually the people that have the most inclination and time to devote to those sites. Uh, they get to be in these positions of power. And I, I think she's absolutely right. Uh, I think last time I read Wikipedia, like something like 90% of the pages uh, were written by maybe 1% or 10%. I'm just making stuff up, right? But anyway, very small percentage of people are responsible for the majority of the edits on Wikipedia. And it's uh, precisely the people that are willing to invest the most time. So that's who you're dealing with more so than the whether or not they've got a fancy degree or they went to, uh, they have a, a lot of expertise in the area. It's just basically who's willing to put the time into doing this stuff, right? And so we're negotiating through this a multiplicity of voices. Uh, so, you know, thinking about this again, I, I suppose in terms of uh, Wikipedia, for example, uh, you might think about the how long the page has been around, whether the people that wrote wrote on it also wrote many other pages. Uh, and that, that could be a way, I suppose, to get at how much time they devoted to the activity. Uh, but the idea is, suppose, that somebody has never used Wikipedia before, pops in, puts up an article. Uh, that would be a lot less uh, admissible in, in court, if you will, than uh, the well-vetted uh, Wikipedia article that's had a lot of uh, interaction. So I'm not quite sure what to make of this, but I think uh, we're on the right track. Uh, she also talks about this uh, mnemonic of the house metaphor, and you've probably heard this before, the memory palace idea. If you want to memorize a speech and you were in, a, I guess, a medieval classroom or, or before that, and they might tell you that a tool for memorizing a speech is to think about walking through a palace or a house or a garden, but anyway, some location where there's a well-defined path through it, right? And you want to imagine that the different parts of your speech are located in different parts of this palace, right? So then you, you sort of want to mentally associate, associate each part of your speech with a part of the house. And then when you're up there giving the speech, you just sort of mentally walk through the palace. And uh, it's easier to remember that way. And it really does work. And the evidence I like to use is the... Um, memorizing students names it's a lot easier if they always sit in the same place right then if if they always sit in the same desks uh, then it's a lot easier to memorize their names because you sort of mentally associate the, the locations around the room with their name uh, than it is if they're always sitting in random spots uh, then you know good luck so there's definitely something to this mnemonic uh, now she wants to say though let's come away from the idea of uh, the theater for a minute I mean, uh, sorry, uh, coming away from the idea of the house or the theater, I said it again. <laughs> As a good thing about the palace, uh, and instead of thinking uh, about a theater instead, and it makes sense if you think about being a stage manager, stage director. Uh, so, yes, you could you could have so many different plays, and even if you're giving the same play over and over again, there's so much, so many variables about where to put props or what kind of props you want up there. Seeing Scenery, backdrops, so where do you want the actors standing or what characters do you want on stage? You know, all of this stuff is uh, the result, hopefully, of a purposeful uh, deliberation, right? You, you, you thought carefully about all these things. Otherwise, you, you're in the wrong line of work, right? It's not supposed to be random. Um, so we could apply that as a heuristic, that, that, I, that concept, I suppose, uh, when we're thinking about something ostensibly very different, like a web page or even a PowerPoint game, right? Uh, where do you want to place the icons? Uh, where do you want the controls? Uh, so I think it makes a lot of sense to think about it in terms of being a, a stage manager or a theater, uh, somebody putting on a the theatrical production and really thinking about that uh, that scene, or that's that theatrical space and how you want people uh, to direct people's attention through that space. So I think that would be a very useful heur heuristic. 
All right, so here we go with the first question. Do you agree with Romberger uh, that the classical rhetorical candidate of memory is useful for evaluating new forms of evidence and making multimodal arguments more cohesive? Why or why not? All right, so let's uh, jump forward then to uh, Morby, and, Morby and Steele. And they're talking here about uh, why we, they think we should be using virtual worlds uh, to teach what they're calling multimodal mastery instead of a traditional print-based literacy. And so like a lot of these authors, they're concerned that our paradigms are too, are too uh, entrenched in, in print, world of print. We're still thinking of, in terms of paper, basically. And we should be making the leap forward into these uh, multimodal, or what they call metamodal forms. And they got a very nice definition here. I always love it when these authors define their terms uh, very clearly, which I think these authors do. Uh, so they got this term called meta metamodal mastery. And let me just read the definition to you, and then we can uh, ponder it. So the ability to discover, create, produce, analyze, synthesize, integrate, and share data content, artifacts, vocabularies, and epistemologies from a variety of fields and many collaborative modes and media within and across metabolic platforms to enhance student learning. So, wow. <laughs> you know, I, I would say if you are have mastered metamodal, if you're a master of metamodality, you have really mastered quite a lot. I mean, wow, look at all that. Uh, but I, you know, maybe it is essential to have this broad of a view. You know, they, they talk in here a lot about transdisciplinary, transdisciplinarity. So really trying to break out of these academic uh, cubby holes we find ourselves in. Right, the you know, you're an English major. What are you doing talking about Second Life? You know, trying to just shatter all these boundaries and get us something a lot more at a meta level uh, in terms of rhetoric or, or communication. So. It's a it's a little bit unwieldy, but I think they they pretty much hit on all the possible aspects of this. So that's what I, I like the inclusiveness, I guess, of this uh, definition. And then they talk a lot about Second Life and uh, this product I had never heard of before. This uh, Croquet, uh, which is I guess a free and open source version of something like a Second Life. And I've looked into it a little bit after reading this article, and I want to explore it further, uh, but. I think I've talked before about using Second Life or uh, these virtual worlds and educational settings. A Minskew spent, I want to say something like $50,000 one time buying this island in Second Life. And the idea was this was going to be just so awesome for online learning or for recruitment. Uh, sometimes it was portrayed as the idea was uh, students thinking about coming to a college that could explore the campus and, and sort of recreation of the campus in Second Life, maybe. Uh, that was one of the pitches. Uh, or it could be used, like they talked about in this article, like you could you could, you could take students to a virtual version of uh, ancient Athens or Egypt. Uh, I, I like the example in this chapter about the uh, professor using the, uh, it was a, I guess, a class about natural disasters or disaster scenarios. So, yeah, it would be a little bit impractical to, <laughs> you know, to have an actual disaster. Uh, for the students to explore. And it's a lot easier and safer, frankly, to simulate all that in uh, something like Second Life. Uh, so, uh, that, that's a pretty good example. Uh, they talked about this croquet tool and, you know, taking students on a tour of ancient Athens, you know, it'd be a little hard to do without a time machine, right? But uh, sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, some of the other examples uh, I know of uh, things of this sort, uh, right here on our campus in iSelf, uh, Mark Gill, has all sorts of technologies for making 3D scans. He's actually got ways he can take your, your phone even and take pictures from different angles, uh, you know, different aspects of a, of a space, like, a, you know, maybe a park or some area of campus. And then he can, he can put all that together somehow and make a little 3D uh, environment so you can actually walk around it in a virtual setting. And so I think all that's uh, really cool. I, I, I wish that I was I could come up with more pedagogically valuable ways uh, to use it, um, you know, to use these technologies. I think that's that's kind of where we where we are right now. We're, there's so much potential, but how to tap the potential, I think, is the real uh, question. Uh, so they talked here about how 
uh, virtual worlds could be more pedagogically valuable for trying to replicate the traditional classroom sprint-based literacy. Uh, what I've seen described in other places as the horseless carriage syndrome. Uh, so a lot of the times what happens is teachers, uh, when they think about something like Second Life, a virtual world, their, their first instinct is to let's make an exact model, a scale model of the classroom that we teach in. Let's have a chalkboard in this room and uh, let's have a PowerPoint projector so we can bring PowerPoint into this virtual world and use it just like we do in a face-to-face -face class. And, you know, in a way that makes sense, I suppose. Uh, that's what you're familiar with. But I mean, on the other hand, it's not really, it's sort of thinking about a car as a horseless carriage, right? Instead of thinking about what the car can do that you couldn't do before and really trying to uh, take full advantage of that. And they give some examples of, you know, like a scientific report, for example, that, you know, why is that on paper? It doesn't make much sense. Uh, you could have a scientific report that was embedded within a, a simulation of an experiment, you know, and then you can get in there and really see how it all works, a walk around it, I guess, uh, tinker with the variables. And I, I want to mention a really fun example of this is a game I played called, uh, I think it was called Physica. You know, I probably should have looked at the at the name of this. No, Physicus. Uh, that's it. So as a physics professor, it might have been a teacher, high school teacher, but anyway, physics teacher, and uh, he came up with the idea of making a a three D world. It wasn't a uh, wasn't a massively multiplayer uh, world, but just sort of a puzzle game where you could walk around. All the and all the puzzles were based on physics problems, so you were sort of just like playing a regular game, but the process that you needed to solve the puzzles and get, you know, win the game involved uh, real life physics. Uh, so I thought that was very creative. Uh, I've always tried to think of a way I could do something similar uh, with rhetoric or, or composition. <laughs> I haven't had a whole lot of luck, but uh, hopefully maybe, maybe you will one day. Anyway, I'll tell you what, if you could, you would make a lot of money and be a superstar uh, pedagogue. Uh, they talked too about some problems with virtual worlds, and these are just a lot of practical stuff. I mean, for one thing, Second Life, if you've ever tried to use it, you know, this is a, can be very clunky, especially if you want to get into the really exciting part, which is designing your own virtual objects. It's not, uh, there's a bit of a learning curve there. And not to mention, it's not necessarily stable software. And uh, they didn't mention it here, but there's a lot of seedy stuff that goes on in Second Life. Uh, you probably don't want to expose your students to, especially if they're younger you know, if they're underage students, you definitely have to be vigilant about all that. Uh, and plus, it's just not really intended for teaching. Uh, so that's a, that's an issue. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that, I would agree that's good enough reasons for me not to try to use it myself. Uh, and, but there are educationally based alternatives. Uh, the problem with those is they don't have those big budgets. And they look pretty amateurish and they, they lack the detail. Uh, the power basically the functionality of second life and especially when you're comparing them and your students will compare them right well this doesn't look anything like a world of warcraft or the you know latest the call of duty game or, or halo or whatever whatever it is they're used to so compared to those products which frankly uh, cost probably upwards of hundreds of millions of dollars to make yeah you're you're sort of uh, the, these professors and faculty created products aren't going to look anywhere nearly as nice and that can be a problem. I mean, students will take it seriously if it looks like crap. Uh, on the other hand, they do posit this this uh, open source program, Croquet. And I don't know how, how familiar you are with this concept of open source, but it's basically since they're not charging for it, uh, they share the code, they put the code out there. And the idea is if you, uh, you know, maybe you don't have the time, the resources to program this whole thing yourself, but, but maybe you can work on a little part of it over here and somebody else can come in and work on this part, and somebody else can work on this part, sort of a collaborative, collaboratively, if we all donate a little bit of our expertise, it all adds up uh, into a wonderful product that, that can compete with the commercial alternatives. And of course, the classic example of that is a Linux operating system. Uh, there's also GIMP, which is a version of Photoshop, basically, that's free. Uh, there's, there's many products like this that have been successful. In the programming world. So then they're probably right about this. You know, if it's going to happen, it's going to have to be one of these open source solutions. All right, so here's my question number two then. Uh, do you agree with Morby and Steel that it's important for students to obtain or to attain a metamodal mastery 
and that we should take on the responsibility in composition of creating a pedagogically appropriate materials and learning environments for the 3D virtual world. Uh, why are we not? So I guess a simple way to think about this is, uh, are you okay just sticking with the, I guess, uh, print-based paradigm? Or do you think it's imperative that we really try to uh, do what we can to uh, take advantage of these 3D virtual worlds? Okay, and then to wrap up, and I thought this was a great place to end this book, uh, this uh, Graben article. There's a couple of art, uh, authors on it here. I didn't list them all, so I apologize for that. But uh, anyway, the uh, topic in this chapter was about expertise. And I guess it sounds like these authors work a lot with uh, teachers who are skeptical or wary or perhaps lacking in confidence uh, when it comes to teaching with the multimodal projects uh, maybe they don't feel like they are they're experts in any of this stuff you know they're <laughs> not what they signed up for right they hey i'm a good good at writing i like to read and write i want to teach reading and writing i feel comfortable with that uh, maybe i'm not so comfortable with prezi or with powerpoint even or with the uh, you know much less uh, something like second life uh, maybe you just got no interest in that um, or maybe you, th you do think it's important but you just feel like uh, you know, I don't know enough about it to, to teach it, right? And even if I sort of fumble with it, uh, how do I know, how do I possibly assess this? You know, i got to put a grade on it, right? Uh, so how do I make that a, a fair process? How do I make that uh, be sensible about that? So I think these are really good questions. I know I've asked them these questions to myself all the time. Uh, so their, an their answers are kind of interesting. Uh, they talk about multi- uh, valence or multivalently, multivalence, multivalent uh, logics, I suppose. And so they're calling that a, a kind of definitional stasis on which other aspects of teaching, rhetoric, and writing rest, uh, which uh, to me boils down to this. Uh, we need a more complex or more flexible, versatile uh, definition of writing. You know, we want to come away from that one size fits all uh, model for sure. And understand there are multiple meanings even of what we mean by composition. You know, this is true. If you ever look on Amazon for books about composition, you probably won't find uh, rhetoric books up there. You know, I said most people think of composing music <laughs> music compositions usually what pops up. So, <laughs> you know, I don't know if they mean it that literally or not. But, you know, it does make sense, I think, to, you know, we've seen many authors talk about this, right? Trying to be a little bit more uh, flexible by, when we talk about writing. I understand that there's different things we might get up to in a, in a composition classroom besides five paragraph essays, right? Uh, in this part, uh, they talked about these uh, components of evaluation writ large. Uh, so the idea here, I suppose, is trying to think at a meta level about how we might go about it. evaluating anything, I guess, from a wiki project to a PowerPoint project. Uh, they talked about at what point in this text about uh, t-shirts so they made t-shirts <laughs> i think one remember that uh, previous article we read about the uh, the garbage cans you know so you're really getting a lot of different kinds of of uh, products coming into coming out of these uh, sort of classes when you open up these ideas right so how do you evaluate all this stuff and they've got a uh, nine criteria that they're looking at and, and some of these i understand and some of them i'm frankly kind of puzzled by and so i would appreciate your help uh, with those now some of them are make make some sense so let me just go through them with you here uh, so the first one is what they call challenges of representation uh, so you want students to realize that they're just the way they describe an experience or an event it's not the only way to describe it and especially if you're talking about groups of people or issues right the, uh, there's, there's sort of competing uh, description of those, descriptions of those, and it's it's a challenge to represent something in a fair way, or an objective fashion. Uh, and, you know, just being aware, <laughs> that's not easy. I suppose that's the criteria we could all agree on. I mean, it'd be great for students to realize that. Now, the second one, the situatedness and contextual nature of writing, uh, the so what question. Uh, so a lot of us want students to go beyond thinking of writing for the teacher only, just writing for a grade on an assignment, uh, to try to have a, a deeper understanding of how writing really works in, in the real world. 
<laughs> outside of these sort of artificial contexts of a classroom. You know, and again, that that's wonderful. Uh, the third one's one that I don't really get, ownership. And they say it's sort of clarifying their purposes, rethinking supporting points. You know, I don't know what to think about that one. Uh, I've heard teachers talk about they want their students to take ownership of their paper to really feel like they they own that paper that it's theirs as opposed to something they're sort of writing in a, just to fulfill an assignment or trying to imitate something else uh saying what they want they think you want to hear or something but anyway i was just sort of puzzled by that one uh another one is being aware of active and unstable or i guess being aware of genres as not being these stable things that uh, there's so many different things you can do within a genre. You can push against the boundaries. Uh, so instead of, for example, it's time to make a PowerPoint presentation. So instead of uh, trying to make the PowerPoint presentation like all the other ones they've ever seen, uh, instead to think about, you know, what can you do with this genre that isn't typically done? Or how can you be creative with the genre? How can you destabilize it? Uh, so I, I love that one. Uh, they also talked about style and delivery. And more specifically, to be experimental with it, not just go the same route every time, but to experience uh, experiment with different styles and uh, delivery. And a lot of us do this already, right? Uh, even back to uh, who was it? Uh, Cicero or Quintilian? Uh, forgetting my ancient rhetoric, but that that old assignment about you know write the letter, write the same letter one to your friend, one to your teacher, or one to your parents, and one to your principal. You know, those sorts of uh, experiments. Uh, we could certainly extend that to, you know, different multimodal projects. Uh, organization and coherence. And again, I think we could go back to the previous article and talk about the uh, that theater model or theater, or theater metaphor again. You know, how well is this sign posted? Is it clear how to navigate this document? Have they put some thought into that? You know, that's something you could, you might not know anything about PowerPoint, uh, technically speaking, but you know, if it's hard to navigate it or if it makes sense uh, how it's set up, right? You know, any of us would be in a position to evaluate that. Uh, dissonance is an interesting one. So finding points of conflict or instabilities, uh, either I suppose within an argument or within a, a stylistic system or delivery system. Now, you know, I, I like to think of this one as being aware of some of the uh, problems with a a, multi, a multimodal project or something like Prezi, for example, or PowerPoint. You know, there's certain things that are hard to do or that uh, limit you. Uh, I guess that's, not, that's probably not exactly what they mean by dissonance. But anyway, this, this could be a source of insight, you know, thinking about these conflicts. Now, process awareness, that's cl another classic one that we goes all the way back to the roots of composition, right? And so not so much that it's not so important that everybody follow the same process, you know, brainstorm, uh, draft, uh, revise. You know, you don't want students feeling like they have to a lockstep approach. Uh, that's not so important as just being aware that, that they have a process and uh, that they've worked out a process that works well for them. And if they're stumped or they're having trouble writing, uh, to experiment with different processes and, and be, to be aware of what works for them and what doesn't work so well. You know, again, that's something we could apply. And then the uh, last one there. Uh, active reading, you know, this is <laughs> you know, one that we all would like uh, for everyone to do. You know, I think they, you know, it's one thing to listen, it's one thing to hear, one thing to listen, you know, right? It's one thing to read, one thing to, to actively read. Uh, so all of those I think are really good, even if I don't quite understand all of them. <sighs> or at least not, I'm not quite sure what they mean by them. I take my own meaning sometimes, and that that's okay, right? Uh, so question number three, then, the last, uh, to wrap up here. Uh, do you agree with these authors uh, that we should, quote, think more independently as evaluators of unfamiliar genres? And beyond that, uh, to realize that the intellectual work of teaching can be, in fact, done by inexperts? I wanted to mention here, in a passing, uh, a book by Ron Sierra, one of my favorite theorists, and he's got a book called The Ignorant Schoolmaster, where he talks in there about how uh, really sometimes not knowing a topic at all makes for a better teacher than one who uh, sets, him, sets him or herself up as an expert, as an authority. Uh, because uh, what you don't want from students is to feel like they need to imitate you or that uh, they can't think independently or they can't challenge you 
or that they in fact need a teacher uh, to learn something, uh, then instead what we should be teaching is more autonomy uh, or uh, general learning skills so that, uh, you know, I guess uh, what we'd really, would really like is to get students to a position where they don't need us anymore and they can uh, learn on their own, right? Uh, but anyway, we'll uh, wrap it up there. Uh, thank you very much uh, for listening, and I'm uh, really looking forward to getting into this uh, next book about games, and I hope you are too. If you have any other questions or comments, feedback, uh, please let me know, and I'll see you next time.